So today we've got Al Taylor. Al's had a bit of a different journey to everyone else we've spoken to so far. He started out as a Ministry of Styles DJ, and now he runs his own IT reseller, focused on Citrix networking technology. He's going to share with us the highs and the lows, what he's learned along the way, and why he does what he does today. I hope you enjoy it, because I found it really interesting. It's a long one. Please use the chapters below if you don't want to watch certain sections. Like, subscribe. Let's have a listen to what he has to say. So, well, thanks for uh, spending some time with me this evening. I know time's precious. Um, so I just wanted to try and get your view of the world and how your career has progressed and just give the community an idea of, of who you are and what you do and, and how they could maybe follow in your footsteps to a degree on how you've managed to build a business. I think people would be very interested in hearing that. Mm, it's um, it's an interesting story, I guess, because I mean, really, my name is Al. I'm Al Taylor. I'm a co-founder and CTO at Cloud DNA. CTO is a very grand title, I think, but it helps a lot of our American friends figure out where I fit in the grand scheme of things. But really, I'm a, I'm a techie at heart. I enjoy the technology. I like talking about the technology and I like understanding the way the technology solves the problems and the real world stories that go around that. So being in this position where there's technical leadership, we're deciding uh, in Cloud DNA, which is uh, the, the company that I run uh, along with my uh, co-founder, who's also my other half, who's uh, sat in the office pulling the late one at the moment. Cloud DNA Beast is is constantly evolving. It's constantly morphing. It's constantly changing around um, the market conditions, the requirements, the technology that's available and the challenges that sit out there. And never before has this been more apparent than this year, I think. Um, we're obviously with the various different scenarios that we find ourselves in. So um, my little world is, is sat around here generally. It's spending an awful lot more time in the office than it used to do, certainly. Um, but the um, the day-to-day -day is, uh, is, a, is a very varied thing, generally speaking. Yeah. Oh, and it's like, um, I know you've got a dog as well, so I'd like walk, take the dog to work. I've seen a few pictures online. You want to see? Team it? mascot. There we go. There we go. We'll do this. It'll be fine. Let's make this TV. <laughs> She's always here. You're right. So she, she kind of wanders along and she comes along and just kind of keeps the job going. But she's she's uh, she's either the project manager barking orders at people or she's there we go. Talk, there we go. Uh, she's always in the office every day. So this Aww. is our, our little office mascot and she's uh, the Taylor family dog. And uh, she'll tell us if it's lunchtime and we haven't eaten yet, she'll let us know. And uh, if it's home time, she'll let us know because she's probably hungry as well. <laughs> so yeah she's, she's always wandering about uh, and generally we'll be having a little meeting somewhere and she'll just wander into the back of the shop so people have kids that, uh, that wander in and out it's not yeah. here it's just it's just the dog kind of comes in and stuff so yeah we're um it, it's kind of a we made a conscious decision a little while ago and i mean really in, in an ideal world we'd have spent the amount of money we spend leasing this office on, a, on an annual basis would have spent it a bit more in a garden office than we would have to walk but the, um, the six minute walk isn't particularly challenging. Uh, we're just in Ford Ends, so we're on the River Thames, so if the weather's nice, we can wander, along, wander along the river. And I notice you've got your Star Wars little video game in the background there, yeah, so yeah. a little claim to fame to us. It's about a mile up the road now. Um, the Mandalorian, is that what they call it? Yeah. The new TV series? They're, they're filming that here. So in a galaxy far, far away, next to the sewage works in Little Marlow, is a film set being built there. They've been doing it for the last three or four weeks, and it's... Um, uh, it's it's a, it's a short time away, I think, when we start to see Ewoks and stuff wandering down the high street and get a sandwich at lunchtime. <laughs> so, I've, I've been visiting that. I don't know whether that'll work, but, you know, there's certainly a few kids around here that look like baby Yoda. On, on the kind of idea of routines and going back to when I was in school and then finishing school and then, and then thinking about what he wanted to do as a career or a job, how did that start for you? Where did you start out where, and how have you got to where you are today? So I was a deputy head boy at, at, at um, a school up in Welton in Lincolnshire. I was uh, I was very keen on sciences. I got uh, my highest marks in physics. But we're back in the eighties here, so uh, a wee bit a wee bit further back. And I went from that into into Lincoln Technical College and did electronic computer and communication engineering. Um, Computers at that stage, we were programming seven segment displays and little boards and stuff. It was it was proper old school. We didn't actually have keyboards with with uh, with our with our uh, with our motherboards. We had to kind of make it up as we go along. It was a lot of fun, um, but the um, uh, the career path kind of changed a little bit because I got into DJing while I was at college, and it kind of paved my way through college. 
So all the other kids were coming up and kind of, by the end of the week, coppering up. And I was earning 150 quid a night playing records and I was doing three nights a week. So I was doing all right there, really, back in the 80s, uh, early 90s by this stage, by the time I got there. So um, when the, uh, the career opportunities to do electronic engineering were somewhat limited in the early 90s, if you wanted to do... Um, I guess, tractor and agricultural engineering and all that sort of stuff. There were far more opportunities for you or you wanted to work in a shop, but there's nothing against that. But it's just not my bag. I don't like being on my feet all day if I can help it. So I, um, I, I took that path of, of DJing and I did that for 20 years. Um, ended up touring for, well, I, I kind of did the, the, did the local pubs, then the local clubs, then those local clubs were PLC operated. So I went and did that. Uh, and over the course of the career, you, you kind of meet people and you network and you do all the stuff that you, you'd expect to do. And I ended up working for Ministry of Sound doing international tours uh, as a DJ for the Clubber's Guide, the Anthems, um, the Electro House brands. So when they launched an album, I'd do the tour that goes with it. And we did some some cool stuff with that. Um, flying around a lot, you know, doing all the doing all the genuine jet set stuff. And I worked on the Head Candy brand as well as a tour and production manager for that. So we did all kinds of random stuff so it was it was a lot of fun uh, but over that career period smashed my ears to pieces so um uh, the if you're familiar with the all gone pete tong video uh, the film that came out a few years ago there was a a guy there and he's dj and he's basically his hearing's gone to a point where he can't play anymore and it was getting that way so i um i had some time with the uh, the consultants in in the local hospital they did all the hearing tests and i've lost 80 percent of my hearing in uh, both ears, I can't hear above three k in either ear and all that sort of stuff. So they basically said to me, "You need to stop doing this, or you will go deaf." Uh, and at that time, my career had moved on to such a point. I was sharing a flat with a guy that was a Kiss One Hundred DJ in London, and he had an afternoon show in the week there. Uh, so I was playing out all over the place, doing some local gigs around London in the week, and then I'd be flying off at the weekends. And he was doing the radio thing, and so was just carnage all the time we had a 625 square foot lounge in an old victorian button factory and pete doherty from the libertines who at that time was dating kate moss was in the flat three doors along from us and so um there was all constantly kind of paparazzi outside and and just random stuff going on all the time but in between us lived a guy who who now works for fortinet but at the time he worked for an i uh, for a company uh, based in in slough that was a, a software distributor a, a citrix distributor which is where i first met you when i was working there um and um and he basically i, I kind of you know he, he kind of be the the guy that he had a normal nine to five job he was pretty chilled he was he was super cool kind of you know just no drama it was it was uh, he was just a nice guy but it'd be sort of three o'clock on a wednesday morning and we'd come back from a gig somewhere a bit like ah, you know, all the beers and all that sort of stuff. And, yeah. and how many bottles, how many empty bottles of Jack Daniels can you get along the kitchen worked up and all that kind of carry on. And he just rock up and goes, oh guys, it's like, it's three o'clock in the morning. Uh, have you got a glass? I may as well join you because I can't, hey, in you come. But well, I got really friendly with him and he was working for a distributor, a uh, Citrix distributor with the ecosystem stuff at the time, IQSIS, if you're familiar with the brand. And um, he basically said, we're looking for an account manager. I, I recognize, you know, you're after a real job. Do you want to come and have a go at this? I thought, right. As far as my computers are concerned, I want to be able to get access to music on it because we were starting to move files around, MP3 files around the community and that sort of stuff. Then when, when I started, we, you know, we're still on vinyl. We've got about 3,000 12 inches still at, at Taylor Towers, which we call it Taylor Towers, but it's a bungalow. It just amuses us. But the um, the vinyl collection is getting large and the 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 um, the, the uh, um, the workout every time you went to a gig to carry around enough vinyl to do a five hour set was get, I was a big lad in those days. But the, um, the, the digital revolution came. So I had my computers there and I could basically, if, as long as I can get tunes out of it, that's all I was interested in. And he said, well, you're going to be working with this company called Citrix and they do something called virtualization. And I thought, I have no idea what you're talking about, but I'll go and have a little <laughs> chat and see how we get on. So I went for an interview and Slough was an awful lot further from Islington than I thought it was. So I was about three quarters of an hour late for the interview, uh, but managed to get a second interview uh, and did the usual closing kind of technique where, um, well, I, I think you might have some traction here, but you know, we'd like you to speak to the managing director. I said, good, is he here? And he's like, uh, well, oh, no, he's not actually. Right. Is he here tomorrow? Uh, yeah, okay. So is he morning or afternoon, you know, two o'clock or three o'clock? And I was half an hour late for that one as well. But I managed <laughs> to get the job somehow. But when I got there, you know, real, real, and, and I was still kind of 
tidying up some freelance DJ gigs at that point as well. So I was literally on a plane going up to Aberdeen. So I worked there for a week before Christmas. And my first night was the um, uh, the Christmas party, which they'd hired out a thing at Thorpe Park, you know, the, the uh, theme park just in West London there. And it was all this full on, you know, all black tie and all that kind of stuff. And it was just carnage. They were all falling out because they were all getting drunk and all falling out with each other and stuff. And I thought, oh, this is just like my normal job. This would be perfectly fine. So um, so I had a week of kind of intensive learning, doing all my Citrix sales professional training and all that stuff. Literally a, a baptism of fire and you go. And then I, um, uh, I was living in Windsor by that point and I kind of uh, I needed to go to Heathrow. So I went straight from work and I was sat there on the plane reading the PNDs, the partner notification documents. So I printed a load off and was reading about net scalers on the way up there because I'd been given a bunch of accounts as an internal and the majority of them had a network flavor to them. And they were talking about this mystical beast called a net scaler. And I had no idea what it did. So obviously you go through the process and learn these things. Damien Saunders time at Citrix, if you remember that far back, you know, it was a long time ago. Um, learned that way around there. And I thought, actually, you know what? This is a really cool box, right? Okay, it's, it, I, I get all that over there and I get all that over there, but this little thing in the middle, why is nobody talking about this? Um, and just at that point, Mike moved on to go and work at that point for Expand Networks, the old one optimization vendor before he went to Fortinet. And uh, he, he left a gap and there was this, this we need a networking um, sales specialist effectively. Now, obviously coming from the college background, I guess I had a little bit more of a technical mindset than the average salesperson that was in there at the time. But um, we went through uh, a very short process of kind of just upskilling a little bit. And then I took that role on and I sat there for five years or so. And it was over that time, I guess, that, that we really, I recognized the importance of network and connectivity and, and and user experience and those sorts of things, the sorts of things that you and I talk about on a daily basis now with our customer base. Um, but really at that point, it was still an awful long way from where we are today and where app delivery controllers and load balancers are just kind of commonplace now. There was still a lot of mystical kind of air about it. But um, Joe was the um, uh, product marketing manager for Citrix. She had anywhere up to half a million dollars a quarter to spend on marketing. I'd go and help customers or our customers, which were the partner base, then um, close deals, or you know, ultimately go and explain and do do the virtual uh, team member thing and go into a meeting with these guys. But we kind of got to that point where, after five or six years of doing that, we just said, you know what? There's there's very few partners in the UK that you could go to and say, I want to talk about Netscaler in particular, and you could get a coherent conversation at that point, answer all the questions, and really get the um, uh, get the value out of the product. There's very few people you could do that. There were subsets of it, but, but you know, there were odd, odd, very skilled people that were buried in very large organizations and it would be difficult for, for folks to get hold of them. And so, so we basically said, okay, well, let's have a go. You know, how hard could it be? So we, we kind of started out with a, a, um, a couple of MacBooks. Um, I did a load of blog posts um, under the Netscaler Taylor piece, which came about from one of our customers because we had two people called Al Taylor in the office and one of them was Ginger Al and the other one, uh, was me, and it was difficult to tell which was which on the telephone for obvious reasons. None of this video call in Malarkey. Uh, so I became Netscaler Taylor, and he was Al Taylor, and that was how we kind of came up with a name, really. And then, and then off the back of that, a little Twitter handle, and you go through the motions and stuff. But just continue down that path of personal development and personal understanding, and really having the opportunity to speak to lots of different people in lots of different um, environments and lots of different contexts about where the technology was fitting. And so you kind of you just build the experience then over time you know that as well as i do but the the net effect of that was we we wanted to find a way to let people know that um cloud dna was about the net scaler it was about getting more out of net scaler so i was sat there um with joe at the, at the dinner table in our little cottage in in cookham in berkshire and we're sort of saying how do we let people know that we're into this and, and i was drinking out of one of those i heart new york mugs at the time which i picked up on a gig on the, on the way back from a gig in december um, that was out in the Dominican Republic and, and stopped over in JFK on the way back and all that sort of stuff. So I got my little mug there and I go, I don't know. So we, we came up with that, which is the old I Love Netscaler, which I'm sure is breaking various different trademark and copyright infringements in there. <laughs> What's the new name again? Sorry, Citrix what? <laughs> uh, yeah, can't remember. <laughs> off the back of that i mean we've ended up with several iterations of that little stickers we do the i love netscaler paper every week which is just a roundup of all that stuff but that's been going now for six seven years now um and really that's the story we, we kind of we started out there and that we've stayed true to our original plan we've stayed 
Um, you know, we, we still do the rest of the Citrix portfolio, but we don't lead with that. There's there's some great resources out there. You've mentioned Neil, who's one of your guests. You know, there's lots of different folks that are really skilled around that. And, and yes, we pick that up. And yes, we've got skill set in that. But we really lead with that networking piece. And I guess, obviously, over time, as, as the network has become more obviously critical to user experience and success and productivity and all those sorts of things, um, that we've kind of helped. I, I like to think that we've helped kind of push that message in our own way. Uh, you're obviously in various different programs of vendors or CTAs or CTPs or whatever it is. You've got that many acronyms after your name now. You look like a, you look like a, I don't know. It's like a really rubbish doctor. Well, maybe that. <laughs> maybe just like the, uh, yeah, like a user guide or something like that. There's acronyms <laughs> everywhere, isn't there? You need your own little acronym list with you. Here you go. Here's my card and here's what all the acronyms mean. <laughs> um, but you, you kind of, um, uh, yeah, we, we just, we just, sow the seeds and, and, and all those sorts of things but really I guess what that meant then is that because we specialize and we're never going to try and deliver everything to everybody we don't want to do that that's not what we're here for we're a specialist we focus on what we're doing and in the process of doing that I think it's built us a lot of bridges into organizations and companies that really an organization of our size which was still you know less than 10 people uh, then we're um, we're, we're able to open doors and add value to organizations that a company of our size wouldn't typically, typically get to engage with. So if we were selling everything under the sun and we tried to go and speak to some of the big public sector providers or whoever else, I mean, you, you know who these customer lists are and, 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 um, and what we do. So we've, um, we've been fortunate that that has um, aligned with Citrix messaging and with the way that the industry is going and with the way that folks are recognizing where the value of, of networking sits in terms of the, their spend. Um, and that ultimately gained us um, the growth partner of the year for Citrix for Northern EMEA for 2018, which was never an, an ambition, never a goal. But I guess if just because we're, we're specialist and we're focused, it opens the opportunities and where we sell those opportunities into some of those customers. And, and you know, as, 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 um, as we're getting well in three figures and half a million dollar uh, POs and that sort of stuff, then naturally, um, we um, we we found some really cool growth. So we had um, over three three hundred percent growth year on year for three years on the trot, um, and that that ultimately culminated in that award back in two thousand well two thousand nineteen when we got it. Obviously, when the the numbers had all been tallied up. So really, we've we've kind of then continued down that path. We've continued to expand just a little bit at a time, and you know we've had some some good hires. We've had some less than good hires, um, and I guess the the challenge now becomes that I'm. Um, it's trying to remain as tight and close to the technology as I can as we're trying to build a business of this size, um, which is growing and which is, you know, starting to have different facets to it and, and, and I've got different hats to wear. So um, no two days are the same, I guess. No two days are the same. I think on that kind of like no two days are the same. What, what does a day for Al look like at the moment, right? So obviously you get out of bed, you have your coffee, you walk the dog six minutes to the office. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> how, how does it, how does it go? Way around. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I get, I mean, there's, there's a quick catch up. I mean, we, we, as, as you and I have, have worked, you know, in, in our own little home offices and remotely for a long time. So this, this kind of culture shift that a lot of folks have had to go through to come into working from home on a day-to-day -day basis and all those sorts of things, it's just kind of normal for us, right? This is the way we've always worked. So um, my days are always governed around customer meetings and I try and do as many of those as possible because it's very important for me, um, either personally and professionally, that we understand the, the real challenges, not just the stuff the vendors are telling us is happening. Because we, we, we often forget, I guess, in our industry as well, when, when you're good at what you do and not trying to be clever about that, but when you focus on something and you give yourself the time to be good at it, you often forget how, how close to the bleeding edge of what is actually technically possible we work. And while there are some customers that want that, there are many of those customers who are a couple of years behind us. And so trying to keep on top of the technology and what's possible, but also keeping in line with what people actually want to buy and what problems they're seeing today, just speaking to people is the best way to do that. And that's why I've, I've previously been involved in things like, um, you know, the Citrix community meetups and those sort of the my Citrix um, uh, community and, and um, various other public kind of events like we used to do the IP Expo series and the Digital Transformation Expo series and I'll go and stand on there for a couple of days and do stand duty just to hear what people are talking about because it's those it's those stories that resonate with our customers and it's those problems that people have that need solving which are more relevant about the latest in developments into a 
Kubernetes service mesh integration and those sorts of things for some people. So the days are completely governed around sitting in front of one of these things normally now, rather than being out in front of customers. There is still uh, a lot of um, uh, unique content being, being generated. There's more video now. So we, we're videoing a lot more stuff now. There's a lot more blog posts coming out now. While we're in this kind of lockdown period, we've seen from our own uh, marketing efforts that consumption of certain assets and consumption of certain things is happening at a greater scale and people are actually paying attention to stuff a bit longer now because they've got the time to do it because they haven't got the commute and that kind of stuff. So um, every day is different, um, but it always involves walking the dog here in the first place and walking the dog back at the, at the end of the day. And what happens in between those two things is, is really anybody's guess. Um, so what would you say the most memorable moment in your career is? Uh, in this industry, I guess the um, the very first Netscaler op that I worked on uh, was a really uh, poignant one for me um, because it was the um, NHS blood and transplants here in the UK. So these are the folks that are responsible for blood donations and, and distribution of blood and, and all the various stuff that goes out with that. And we've become blood donors um, over the course of time as kind of part of that after seeing the work that those guys do. But we did a project there a long, long time ago, back, back with the 7000 series net scalers. And um, it was all about server offloading and infrastructure um, uh, offloading and all those kind of core traditional sort of ADC messages that we used to speak about. Um, and uh, the basic gist of it was it was it was centralizing the um, uh, the mechanisms that go into that blood and transplant, so organ transplants and donors and those sorts of things. But off the back of that, there was a kind of an ancillary project that was going to be the next project. But the the net effect of what we did with the net scaler and the kind of the stuff we did that was then allowed, almost like there was almost like a, at the time there was like a Facebook, probably an unfortunate term there, but Facebook for for organ donors and recipients, yeah. um, so that those who who'd lost loved ones could could kind of continue the relationship with the recipient donor, uh, a recipient of the of the donor's organs. And that was really poignant. That was the first time I think I stopped looking at the technology as a sale. I, I was coin operated a lot of that time. I was very sales or, orientated, but that was the first time I kind of stopped and looked at it and thought, actually, this, you know, this kind of, um, this moves beyond just ones and noughts and switches and, and all the stuff that governs that goes on inside a box. This, this is kind of the, the human element to it. And it's quite poignant that. And there's been, you know, there's been some real massive trophy wins back in distribution days. I was involved in Bet365 when they were scaling. We did, you know, vast POs for um, the, well, the organization you work for now, but under their previous guys and, and the team there. So there was some really cool stuff there. But that, that kind of personal thing of blood and transplants was really cool. But what was also really interesting is full circle to that about three months ago, we were uh, involved, heavily involved in the architecture and the structure of um, part of the UK's response to COVID. And under NDAs, we can't say what it is, but um, it touches every single part of us, every single person in the country. Um, when we do projects like that, that, that un unbeknown to us at the time, or potentially we're aware of, of, of the size and the implication of what those things are doing, um, but things like a project that, that we worked on um, earlier, um, you know, or, or was it last year? It was last year now, wasn't it? Yeah, last year. Yeah, yeah. Which which co coincidentally has been core to the to, to the UK's response to COVID. And then ultimately, um, this project a few months back, which is now quite a public project. Um, we're on the successful part of that public project, I'd like to mention. <laughs> but, you know, that again, watching how the projects that we're involved with permeate their way through society and the good that's the stuff that we can do is that human element to it biggest mistake that you think you've made and the lesson you'll learn from it oh there, there are dozens there are, I, seriously there are there are dozens i mean i i you know i i've got no formal education in business management i've got no um formal education in people management um i like to think i'm a fairly reasonable person to get on with but i guess the folks that have have been and gone from cloud DNA would disagree <laughs> or some of them would at least um I think the the um there's there's lots of these little things especially on LinkedIn at the minute where everybody's a a, a consultant or a, an expert in something of some way shape or form and the the thought process I mean I guess from here as well I mean with with 
you know, with, with the company that we've got here, it looks like we've gone on this massively smooth or maybe even a little bit of a hockey stick trajectory of, of growth and success along the way, but it isn't, man. It's like this, you know, it's like that. And it's up and down. And every, I guess, you know, the, I'm kind of lazy. So I read books. So rather than go on training courses and, and kind of pick up a book and go through that and stuff will resonate and some things will work and some won't. Um, but the, um, um, the, the key thing is just learning from the mistakes. I'd like to, we, we never say we can do something unless we absolutely know we can do it. Uh, and that's a golden rule in anything. I learned that, you know, a long time before I got into this industry is just be, you know, be not humble, but be, be in control of what is possible and what's feasible and no, none more so than the vaporware dreams and ambitions of vendors that say, behold the future, we're going to do these things for you and then don't deliver it. Yeah. Um, but really, I guess, um, Oh, just yeah. There's there's loads. There's absolutely oh, c covering all vectors. I mean, from from a from a kind of a management side of things here to a uh, to you know dropping some clangers and giving away too much discount that kind of stuff. You know that that's all kind of ancillary. But um, we're still here and we're still telling the tales and grown and and you know if we set another business up alongside, which may happen in the near future, then those mistakes will not be be made we'll learn from it and that's that's you know all you can all you can um, aim to do but in terms of anything that really stands out and said that was a really bad idea at the time i think the only one of those would be a um probably some frippant purchase when i, when I was earning far too much money djing for a living so on, on a kind of note of giving some advice to someone that was starting out in the industry um maybe looking to start their own business to an extent what would be the top three tips you would give them oh wow um, don't chase somebody else's dream. Make sure that what you're doing is something you believe in in that respect and, and um, that you um, give yourself time to focus and be good at what you, you intend to be good at and, and try and make it a hobby in the first. If you can make a hobby into a, into a work stream, then you're onto a winner. And, and I did that with DJing and, and to a certain extent, I guess in this instance, it's become that way as well through this journey. Mm. Um, I would say in this day and age, don't lease an office. Probably won't need one of those in a year or two's time. Uh, but other than that, I would say um, get involved in the communities. If you're interested in a particular topic, a particular vendor, a particular uh, trend that's going on in the industry, then get involved in the communities. And now that they've, they've gone online, it's even easier to join these things wherever you are in the world. But you'll get so much support and help and knowledge from people who are also interested in that same topic. And they will, without a doubt, every time they'll find, you, you'll find in those relationships, you'll get a little step up, a little help up. You'll be uh, presented with opportunities. You'll be given opportunities to network that you just take every single thing. Cause, you, cause I think it was it Michael Jordan who says you'll miss hundred percent of the shots you don't go for. Yeah. Go for it all and just see what happens. Because if you keep saying yes to stuff, then you're going to, at some point, you've got to drop lucky, considerably luckier than if you keep saying no to stuff. So changing up a little bit, so let's talk about the industry. And obviously a lot's changed over, over the time that, that well, I've been involved in, and definitely since you've been involved in the tech industry from moving from DJ into this, this world. What, what, what has changed? What's the biggest impact you've seen, the biggest change? It's cloud, isn't it? It's, it? it's 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 cloud consumption models, and I think we're we're right. I mean, again, working on the bleeding edge of stuff. There's there's an awful lot of technologies that float around, and they solve point the kind of point products that solve point problems. They might be baked into an ADC or baked into something else, but it's a it's a fix for a problem. But I think the way that um, the, the industry is in this massive paradigm shift at the moment, and it's this constant juxtaposition with like the actual vendors themselves. So if you think when we we started out, when you and I started out, you would sell a product and then there'd be a whole bunch of services days off the back of that to go and plumb it in and do it and configure it and tune it and do all the stuff that we would do with that. And and, and that for us as an industry was was lucrative, right? That's how you paid the bills. You would you would you would generally get a, a real good chunk of, of of the profitability for your effort would come from the professional services that you would bolt on the back of it. And certainly from that, that would also be your opportunity to add value to the customer engagement so that um, you became that trusted advisor, you continued that relationship with the customer. I think what's really um, interesting to watch at the moment and, and partially concerning, I guess, as a business um, director, a manager, owner, um, the, 
um, the rise of intent-based configuration and the simplicity of which the, the GUIs and the, and the control planes now offer even somebody with fairly modest experience the ability to configure some fairly complex stuff that would take days or weeks or months in the past. That's a challenging paradigm shift for us as an industry. And, and, and as these kind of products that we would sell and would make lumps of profit and you know we'd go on to the next one, as that becomes now um, effectively kind of commodity sales now and, and people are subscribing to licenses. I mean, you take something classic like an exchange rollout. If you, if you were an organization, 500 seats, and you wanted to put an email system in and exchange was the flavor of choice that you went for, um, you know, we'd, we'd, you, there'd be all the various stuff that goes in there. You'd have somebody come in and actually configure the exchange environment to do the stuff that you wanted to do, but also then the actual delivery side of it. So we did a lot of projects early doors when, when we were doing, you know, exchange in front of your CAS servers and all that sort of stuff. And then you'd have maybe GSLB to go over to a second data center somewhere. And, and then it was actually three global data centers. You did all this kind of, you know, all that kind of stuff that was there, which is now you just say, uh, it's like three pounds ten a month, or four or five dollars a month, and it's Office three sixty five, and the gateways are there, and it's done. All right. So from a user experience perspective, from a user investment perspective, it's awesome. All right. From a, from the end user perspective, that is awesome. But then it's up to us as an industry to say, okay, if we don't adapt, if we don't change, while there's still a little bit of of um, business there to be had, and certainly there's the transaction of the license and that kind of good stuff, but that professional services. Uh, revenue is definitely diminished from there. So how do we remain relevant and, and what, what happens next in that respect? And we're fortunate that kind of SD-WANs plugged the gap where ADC was going, because I guess in, in our world, in a, in a Citrix world, we used to sell a lot of net scaler product and professional services around it. Um, the artist formerly known as Netscaler, we used to sell a lot of that to support a virtual apps and desktops or a Zen app or a presentation server rollout, whereas that's all now baked into Citrix Cloud. So that that's kind of gone. It's still there a little bit, but it's predominantly gone. So what do we replace that with? Well, SD-WANs come along and, and that's obviously a big, big game changer, but you know, we, we were involved in that five and a half years ago now in May 15, when, when um, myself and a colleague at the time, we went to Chalfont, the Citrix office in the UK, and we were the, sat there and listened to this new way of, of delivering services over the WAN. I was like, yeah, this is really, really cool. But you know, that, that, that's taken, I mean, we're five years down the line and it, you could argue now it's really starting to gain some real kind of serious traction. Um, but that five years has been interesting as we've gone through that process. But really then now that's sort of coming, almost becoming commoditized because of just the sheer volume of vendors in the mix and all the ways you can bake it into a firewall or a, your hypervisor vendor of choice or whatever that flavor may be. Um, what happens next? And that's really, you know, that's up for me as I guess as a CTO hat on, uh, very grand but but necessary, I suppose. But um, where does cloud DNA focus next? Where is the next relevant thing that we're going in? And it, chances are it's going to go down that security route because by default we do a lot of that anyway. Um, but realistically, it's up to us to to, to remain relevant and to remain. Uh, of value to our customers, whether they be the, the existing ones or the, the new ones that will attract along the way. I think on, on interesting times, right, is the, the current situation that we're in with, with this pandemic. How, how, how have you seen this impact uh, positively and negatively yourself and, and your customers that you've come across? Because I've seen quite a lot of positives come out of this as well as some of the obvious negatives that are coming along with it. I saw um, when this all first kicked off, I saw, I saw someone bitching and moaning on LinkedIn that his company wasn't providing pizza on a Friday afternoon like they normally did because everybody's working from home. And I thought, um, well, firstly, you wouldn't, you know, if, that, if that's your primary reason to go and work on a Friday, you wouldn't have a job here in the first place. But I mean, it's nice to have. That's, I get that, right? But I think what, what has, I mean, firstly, the, the working day is extended. You look at your inbox now and your colleagues that would normally be shutting off by six, seven o'clock at night are all done, are now kind of putting the kids to bed and then carrying on later on. Um, and I think that's that's kind of been a big shift. I think for the kind of organizations that you and I have spoken to and, and um, kind of sold the virtualization dream, I think they've been just so well placed here. Um, they've been fortunate that, that they've chosen, chosen a route that has given them the opportunity to have this remote access solution, which is for all intents and purposes, exactly the same as the working when they're on, on site in an office and those kind of things. So those folks that had gone down that route and, and, and really 
drunk the kind of Citrix Kool-Aid or the VMware Kool-Aid or the, the Microsoft Kool-Aid as that goes on now and, and, and other virtualization vendors of your choice. Um, I think what's been really rewarding there is the companies that we've been involved in in the previous years leading up to now. As this really kicked off, um, the uh, you know early part of March in the UK when it started to look a bit wobbly and then as it got towards the end of March, it was very much a case of right down tools, everybody's out. Um, and in some instances, you know, we've seen just just no drama just folks have just carried it on as normal uh, and in other instances we've been contacted by organizations who have under extremely stressful circumstances tried to cobble together come some kind of technical response to business continuity and in, in, and in many instances that was just let's buy laptops and go back to the way we we're doing things all that time ago and, and that's cool if that works for them that's cool but that, that then throws up its own set of problems and you know scratching your head and getting always on VPNs to work and all that sort of stuff. And that's, that's kind of been a, been a real, a real change there. But I like the idea that, uh, and, and particularly living down here in the Southeast uh, and very close to Heathrow, um, you know, the lack of aeroplanes in the sky, the lack of cars on the road, uh, when that first all kicked off, uh, you know, back in April, May time, when it was really, um, really kind of poignant at that point, um, that was a really interesting time to see. But what I've seen now is as this digital transformation was, you know, a nice to have for a lot of people. And it was kind of, yeah, we'll get around to that and, and those kind of things. And you've seen the thing, right? Where it's like, who's been your, your main digital transformation catalyst in your business? Was it CTO? Was it CIO? Was it COVID, COVID, tick, COVID, tick? You know, because it's like, we had to do something. But now I think out of the positives that's come out of it, organizations that have potentially had to put these kind of mechanisms in place because they were forced to to survive have now actually seen the light and, and sat here in our little office, which is, like I say, just a six minute walk from home. We can see that the road is busier than it was a few months ago, but it's nowhere near as busy as it was a year ago. And I'd like to think that we've taken some miles off the road. I'd like to think that we've given people some home time back because working from home has the massive benefit of no commute. I think that those all, uh, those folks that work a little bit of distance away or obviously being here in the commuter, commuter belt for London and it would be quite typical, we'd see literally a couple of thousand people every day get on a train to go that way and we'd see them get off a train again over the course of the different trains that come in in the evening and the railway stations directly opposite the office here. Um, giving those people that time back to stay at home, be with the family, be there for the kids, that kind of thing. You hear these kind of stories and and I think if anything, I hope that that will continue when normality returns, if it returns. I hope that it returns with this element where working from home is more acceptable for those organizations that have struggled culturally to allow it in their, in their workplace. So I think that the, um, uh, again, the human aspect of what's gone on here, and, and there is no doubt there's, you know, COVID as a, as, a, as, a, um, as a disease, as an ailment, as all the things that comes around with it is, is horrific. Uh, and, and I know people, I know of people in this local area who have died from it. Uh, and it is, um, uh, it's, it's very, um, it's, it's an awful, awful thing. But if anything good has come out of it, then potentially that little bit of headspace that that's given is, is you know, it's, it's down to the technology again, that's allowed people to just continue in some way, shape or form. I remember seeing an image, I think it was like, probably in June, July, when everything was still in lockdown, no one couldn't travel. And you can see that the, the, the difference in colour of the ocean on the coastal routes and yeah. basically going from this murky green color that we normally have around the uk right to almost crystal blue waters which Amazing. shows the amount of toxic we put into the into the environment purely living our lives right and i think that's one of the things that really hit home for me that if we can enable people to work from home or in a more agile way one day a week in the office two days whatever it makes sense i i'm a true believer that an office is needed for people to an extent for social well-being, mental health and all those kind of things and building meaningful relationships, right? Because these things don't allow you to do meaningful relationships. No. They're, 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 in my opinion, in some cases, a blocker to that meaningful relationship builder. And I, I'm glad that this is allow people to work like this now to help the environment and to help people get a better work-life balance and build the relationship back with their families that they may have started to lose through the way they've been living their lives. Um, but at the same time, consciously myself, I'm thinking, when's that office opening? <laughs> just just for one day, one day a week, just to yeah. the water cooler conversations, right? The things, if you're in these four walls on your own all day, you, you, for me personally, there's no one to talk to other than, other than the wall. Yeah. And then um, my, my, my son's in school and my wife's 
doing whatever she needs to do to get ready for when he's finished school. So it's it's kind of it's a very different for me a very different way of working. Um, but it's been it's been great over the last few months. But would it be something I would personally like to do forever? Work from home five days a week? Probably not personally. I would like at least one day out and about, seeing customers, meeting people, socializing, that kind of thing. So I'm probably more of a probably well, it's like an extrovert kind of thing. So I like being out there, I like talking to people, like that human thing, right? Understanding what people are trying to achieve and why, which sometimes is quite difficult over audio and virtual meetings. Yeah, agreed. And I get, I mean, one thing I would say I miss above all else, well, there's two things really, is the um, going and doing like the seminar things, whether it's the, the Citrix community group or the, the, you know, the Expo events and those kind of, you know, uh, um, vertically aligned events. Enjoy that. Um, uh, and also just whiteboards, just getting on a whiteboard in, in, in front of a, a bunch of really switched on techie folks and, and solving the problem. Um, that, that's a super rewarding part of the job and, and, and it's still feasible, it's still possible here, but it's not the same as obviously, you know, give somebody else the pen and they scribble a bit and then, you know, you come back and think, like, Whoa, you get one of those big tech scribbles going on. So we miss those. Um, but the, um, uh, that, that whole thing about being in the office 100% and we're, we're fortunate because, I mean, I say fortunate, we, we, a lot of the team are dotted all over the place, all over the country and, and a little bit outside the country as well. And so the office here is, is if everybody was in it, it'd be a squeeze, but it never really happens that often. So we can have a couple of the folks come in and just be socially distanced and, you know, you've got your mug and you've got your own tea towel kind of thing and off you go. Um, and, I, and, and it's definitely a relief. It's just to get out of there and blow off a little steam and just, um, you know, just talk about something that's just nonsensical that you wouldn't necessarily do on this because you're kind of always on the clock when's the next one. Where, like you say they're just that camaraderie and just uh, just just sharing sharing some stories with with colleagues is um is always a valuable thing to do isn't it yeah definitely and i think moving on to like um final question on the industry um what would you say is an area of technology that you think organizations undervalue and they should be investing in but but they generally don't uh i'm, well, I'm, I'm always biased with this because you know what i'm going to say is networking isn't it because it's <laughs> But I still, it, it's absolutely the case. And, and I, you know, I, I kind of see people who get it right and I see people who don't. Um, I think in, in SD WAN continues to grow in, in popularity and it is still a bit of a dark art to folks and still a bit snake oil to some folks. But I really think that um, doing it right and, and starting to, to sort of shift that paradigm from a spoken hub. I mean, I was, looking, I was doing some research for some fun stuff that we've got coming out publishing. Uh, in the next few weeks and and looking at this whole kind of principle of this spoken hub one mentality and you know that was that was really popular in the 90s way of doing it in the 2000s 2010 that kind of stuff but you actually go back and it's it's, it's almost as old as i am it's a mid-70s concept in terms of you know using tcp and using using a, a wide area network in its concept and potentially you could you trace the roots back further than that we're in a fundamental paradigm shift in the way that the world works now, because you go back 10, 15 years, everything was in the data center and the users were all around the outside. And so, you know, username, password, potential two factor authentication, you know, pass all that and you can come into the data center, you can consume, you can do the stuff, you can be productive. But now you think about it, it's a complete paradigm shift. It's completely the opposite way around. It's now the user that's in the center and the services are coming from all over the place. There's still that physical data center, legacy applications, line of business stuff that's still working and we're still dependent on that. But at the other side, there's the, the, you know, the massive rise of as a service offerings, there's the public cloud stuff. So connecting people in that traditional mechanism back via the data center for internet breakout and stuff like that, we're now seeing adoption of this different model where we've, we've got an edge network and we've got obviously security at the edge and what that means. So that's definitely a, um, uh, a key a key differentiator between the way we were doing things and the way we are doing things um and i think that will continue at grow, to, to scale as people get more comfortable with that concept of we can move away from that 40 45 year old one architecture but the other thing as well is just is, is the amount of technical overlap which is wasting budget wasting effort operationally wasting clock cycles for hosting whether that be in the cloud or otherwise and and where Folks are buying stuff like Netscalers, which uh, or Citrix ADCs as they're called now, which is obviously something that's still very close to my day-to-day um, -day, uh, life, and really not kind of using it 
You know, they'll buy it for a specific problem and they'll plug it in for that problem and have no idea that they can replace all these other vendor objects and things with it and effectively just work more efficiently by squeezing more out of that functionality of that box. And I always find that um, it, it just, a, just a little bit kind of surprising when, they, when you look at the size of the investments in some of these things and folks really never get the true value out of the assets. But I think genuinely speaking, that network connectivity and how that um, becomes more relevant as, as services disappear off all over the place and trying to keep visibility of, of service levels and user experience and compliance and all those kind of things. If you don't get to grips with that network connectivity piece, then you could spend a million dollars a year in hosting costs in Azure, but if your users can't actually connect to it in a performant fashion and be secure and all the other stuff, so That's it's a point. fail, isn't it? The productivity yeah. drops and, and it's a waste of money. Yeah, and I think... Um... One of the things I've been, I've been saying for a long time, it's like thinking about the areas of the industry that for the foreseeable won't necessarily disappear or, or, or to change dramatically. They're going to change, right? But they're not going to disappear. Um, and for me, it's like people are always going to need a device to connect from. Mm -hmm. right? so whether that's their own or whether that's businessly provided with so corporately owned business, business only, corporately owned person enabled, all those kind of approaches, great. The other thing then is, is those devices then need a network to connect to Mm -hmm. to consume those services. And then the third piece then that, that generally never goes away is the security aspects. So how do we secure that data, that user, that device, that service, all that kind of stuff. Where it's hosted, whether it's on-premises, on the cloud, is it hybrid cloud, multi-cloud, this region, that region, this data source, this SaaS provider can change at any point in time. But those three things for me yeah. will, will fundamentally not change because they can't. One thing that's really got my attention recently is decentralized ID and using blockchain ID mechanisms. I think that is potentially a, a real game changer for a lot of people. Getting away from this problem of, of you know, Equifax or Marriott hotels and all these folks that have had literally thousands and thousands of, of, of personal details stolen and, and how decentralized ID and blockchain based ID is going to potentially get rid of that problem. I think that's really interesting. I think that's really got some legs. And some other ways that blockchain is being used uh, away from the financial services models um, to, to make life easier, more secure, and, and try and overcome some of the hurdles that we've got. Um, but but ex exactly as you say there, it's, it's, um, it, it all still comes down to the fact that we, this consume on, on any device or that you know, consume from anywhere, um, it still comes down to network. And it still comes down to network connectivity. Yeah, and especially with 5G up and coming as well, even more so, definitely. Yeah, yeah I mean, it, it, it's it's long overdue. I mean, it's it's the only good thing about the, the COVID stuff now is if you do happen to go into London, you can actually get a signal when you get there, can't you? <laughs> <laughs> it's because the, because the 4G networks are just massively oversubscribed, aren't they? So uh, for that little window of opportunity where 5G is new and it's not over-consumed, it'll be all right. <laughs> One hundred percent, and I think on the on the block on the blockchain piece actually. Um, so I know that Pat Gelson at, at VMware was talking about the democratization of AI, right, and bringing that down to a level where people can afford it and use it to to mine data and get better insights and all that kind of yeah. stuff. I think that's one of the things for me that because blockchain came as a, as a phrase and a terminology and an approach, what at least six seven years ago yeah. now at least, and there's not really but it's had a massive hype and then it just died and went into like a like a bunker somewhere and didn't really get talked about and I think there's an element there of waiting for that to bubble back up to the surface and people to start realizing what they can do with it from a security perspective specifically from my mindset yeah. um, and then how that integrates with all of the services we're delivering out whether it's on network endpoints identity services so on and so forth and I think that's the yeah. bit that we're missing at the moment to to provide that zero trust methodology to an extent yeah yeah agreed uh, it's it's interesting. I mean, I guess like FIDO2 is like the stepping stone, isn't it, at the minute, and how that works. And I mean, you, you, you've kind of gone full circle because you're back to having a physical object, frankly, aren't you, in some way, shape, or form. <laughs> but it's, it, it, it's, it's, um, um, it, it's, it's the nature of the beast, I guess. You know, kind of folks are coming up with different ways of, of bolting bits of technology together. Um, uh, and it's just an interesting time to be observing it. And, and looking at that and, and looking at our portfolio as a as a as a, uh, you know, a partner to our customer base and saying well, what's relevant what's going to solve the next problem and certainly that's where um a lot of reading is going at the moment yeah cool okay so what we'll do now is do the lightning round so on, then. quick snappy answers um first question last technology purchase and why <sighs> crikey uh 
was probably something to do with fixing the camper van. <laughs> probably nothing more, more nothing more involved than a multimeter <laughs> for that reason um, and if it wasn't that then it would probably be um a little piece of studio gear for the office here that i could have probably got away without finding an open source equivalent but that one was more shiny yeah fair enough yeah who's your biggest inspiration uh Probably Joe, really, and I, I say that, and I don't say that because she's in the in the room, but she's just she's just always got my back. She's always uh, uh, always got the answers when I haven't. Keeps us on the straight and narrow, uh, and and a really really um, just the best ally you could ever have. So it's it's kind of cool that we get to work together, um, and, and genuinely, you know, it, it wouldn't be this bubble that I live in. I'm the very public face of our organisation, but without her floating about it it would be on its ass. <laughs> so it's yeah, like, I've gathered that from earlier. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's exactly it. <laughs> What's work-life balance mean to you? There isn't one. There isn't one. <laughs> no, it is, that's the only downside to it. And I guess um, we've said this as well. This is potentially part of the way that we've actually been able to achieve quite a lot because obviously we could be walking the dog on a Sunday afternoon and go, uh, do you know what? And then we'll go back and crack on with it. And I know you're a workaholic as well. You just keep going all the time. And it's, in fact, we're sat here doing this at this time of day. It's, it's testament to that. But um, the, it, it is it is tricky. And and when you know we've got more mouths to feed than just Joe and I. We've got the team here, and there's an element of responsibility in looking after those folks and making sure that they've all got somewhere nice to come and do their thing. It's um, it, it's very very difficult to switch off. I would still. On occasion, I'll get to have a little mix sometime and get get the get the decks out. That's always nice. Uh, the camper vans, godsend as well, because that's um, you know you kind of get off and we tell, try and go somewhere out like New Forest or something like that, and go somewhere where the signal isn't so great, and you're just going to have to shut off for a weekend or something like that. Uh, and then generally, we would typically go and do a bit of yoga because you know I'm a vegan and a tree yoga and all that. But um, a bit of yoga and that sort of stuff would generally be the case, although that's been a little bit tricky to go and do that because I need direction for that, otherwise my mind wanders and I have to go and pick up a pad or a pen or a laptop and do something else instead. So it is, yeah, we'll have to make a conscious decision not to do work things, I guess. But again, yeah. that's another thing where, you know, doing a house up, it kind of, um, it, it gives us a little bit of an opportunity to just focus on something like that. I've got an ongoing issue with an electric shower at the moment that's keeping me busy. Because I have to run a bath every morning at the minute because we haven't done the extension. I've only got one bathroom. It's just... <laughs> <laughs> what, what did you want to do when you finished school? Um, well, I kind of, um, do you know, what? I don't even remember. I think I wanted, originally I was going to be a solicitor, but my spelling's atrocious. <laughs> um, so that didn't work. And then, um, uh, and then I, I was always interested in music and that sort of stuff. But, you didn't there weren't superstar djs in that time um so i kind of just went down that route and i played a bit and, and produced a little bit in a, in a kind of roundabout kind of way not in the way that people do it now but that was always kind of a nice way but i just had to find some kind of means to earn a living and that's what i fell into and to be honest that was after I'd, uh, um you know coming out the back of school and going into college and then djing for a living it's as close to a dream job as you're going to have. I mean, the only alarm clock you have is, is to say, don't don't forget to get on an aeroplane. And um, and all the stuff that goes on and um, and all the things that you kind of associate with that way of earning a living. Yeah, you do all that. <laughs> and, and, and I'm fortunate I'm still standing to, to tell the tale. I uh, just yeah, can't yeah. hear it. <laughs> yeah. And what's your favourite book? Oh, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People by Stephen R. Covey. Oh, nice. Seek first to understand, then be understood. Yeah. I think I've read the first four chapters of that and then I put it on the side. Yeah. And that was it. I've actually got it. It's 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 print there's, there's a the title of each chapter and a, and a three-line synopsis of each chapter. Uh it's it's printed off and it's stuck on a whiteboard around the corner in the office there just to, just a glance at when you're going into a meeting room um mm. it's um it's it's probably the one and i was introduced to it years and years and years ago by somebody who was involved in the motor industry and he was like right, read this and I'm like, oh, read read <laughs> talking about read but they haven't made a film out of it so i went through it and i've read it probably four or five times it's, um it just sits with me. don't do fiction don't have don't have space in my head for it and i'd, I'd struggle with that at the best of times i think i did 
couple of episodes of Breaking Bad trying to do that. And just, it's just nonsense. I could be doing something far more useful in the time. Yeah, um, so, uh, but that tends to be the way. It tends to be a lot of those kind of things, a lot of sort of there is um, personal development kind of reading and stuff like that. And out of all of them, Seven Habits is the one that always, always springs out. Cool. Okay. Most important thing to you? Mrs. T. Mrs. T. Mrs. T. We've got a, there's a there's a little T floating around as well. So she's 22 now, uh, so she's she's um, she's super cool as well. Uh, but again, Mrs. Mrs. T is always just floating around in the background. But it's just it's uh, it's it's uh, we're like a team. It's just like everything works like that. Dog's pretty cool as well. <laughs> cool. If your words of wisdom was to be put in a tweet, what would it be? Uh, more than 140 characters. <laughs> um but yeah I, I i guess i guess the um you know um don't be surprised if you don't get what you didn't ask for cool okay fill in the blank the new normal is uh unusual <laughs> must watch tv show oh gosh uh just uh, don't really watch for you to tell you. <laughs> Grand designs trying to get some inspiration for the house, I suppose, or something like that. But either than that, it's it's probably uh, it's probably sort of like East Enders, but it's just because that Mrs. T likes to watch that, so it's on, you know. So I don't necessarily watch it, but I probably know more about the the cast and the characters and the plot than I probably think I do. Probably, probably. probably. And favorite junk food? Oh, I don't do junk food. I'm a vegan. Ah, oh. so, so, I just never know. I'm I'm nearly fifty. Look at that. So, so, <laughs> no, but uh, yeah, just uh, just don't do it. I mean, you can you can get a fairly decent vegan burger these days, but it's it's um, yeah, don't don't tend to you know it's kind of kind of not that. But Thai food in comparison, uh, like love all that. And um, uh, uh, Mrs T found a an amazing ramen noodle kit thing in the in the local co-op around the corner the other day, a green dragon job. It was the nuts. Brilliant. So I like that. But that's not really junk food, is it? It's just fast and Japanese. Well, it's, it's probably more junk food than I've been anywhere near. My, my, my missus has been keeping me on the straight and narrow with the healthy diet whilst we've been off. Has to be um, done. It helps that Burger King shut as well, I suppose. Because <laughs> yeah. uh, when we came back from Summit, there was a, there was a Burger King in um, Orlando International. Uh, and they had impossible burgers in there, which are those, uh, you know, the uh, the vegan jobs in there, and they are really, really good. But they, um, but obviously with COVID going off, you can't get one at the minute. But yeah, no. I, uh, you know, all in good time. Oh well. Well, I think on on that note, mate, I think we can probably call it a wrap there. So thank you very much for your time again, and um, I'll share this with you before it goes live. Always a pleasure, my friend. Absolutely, always a pleasure. But if you ever get stuck and you got five minutes, you want to just chew the fat and talk some nonsense, then give us a shout. It's always good to chat. Perfect. Thank Take you. care of yourself, my friend. You too. See you later.